Hi there, and you're welcome to another informative and insightful episode of AAU Talks on AAU TV, the voice of higher education in Africa, and I am Ajman Otradakum. So we're still bringing you the series we were here, the investive environment and sustainable development. We're enjoying the time, and I believe you're also appreciating the transformative content that we're bringing you right from the chest of UEAZ so many. And today we're looking at gendered implications of COVID-19. You will bear with me that the coronavirus pandemic has exacerbated um, gender inequalities all over the world. In Africa, it is really a big crush. And not only that, it has created a very huge gap between men and women, where women are forced to go beneath the poverty line. And that causes so much distraction to women and their growth. And it is estimated that uh, 47 million more women will be pushed below the poverty line with the stage of COVID-19. So stay with me as I discuss this topic with a very special guest here at the University of Environment and Sustainable Development. I'll let you know who she is after this short break. Don't go anywhere, we'll be right back. Welcome back to AAU Talks on AAU TV. My name is Ajman Otrodak, home for the break. I was telling you about the topic for today, which is gendered implications of COVID-19, which we're about to reveal more insight into it with my guest, Dr. Daniela D. Sedega, acting dean of students of the University of Environment and Sustainable Development. Doc, you're welcome to AAU Talks. Thank you very much Great. for having me. Great. I also know that you also um, you are also part of the gender committee running gender advocacy affairs here at UESD. Yes, I'm part of the gender team. How has it been so far um, running that affairs and also uh, merging that with student affairs as well? Well, we are we are trying our best. We are putting in a lot of efforts. Um, the gender team has already put down um, a write up to solicit for the creation of a gender center here. Mm -hmm. And it's gone, we are, waking, we are waiting to see how it goes. And then also, we've been able to form the UESD Ladies, which is seeking to empower our ladies. The slogan of the UESD um, Ladies Club is empowered to stand out. Mm -hmm. And that is what we seek to do, to empower ourselves not just ourselves as ladies, but also to empower our students. And so we've roped it in, in collaboration with our Women's Commissioner to put in activities that would highlight concerns of women mm. and then how we'll better find ways of solving them. So, Doc, let's, let's begin this way. Mm -hmm. 21st century is advanced and poised with so much of technology and innovation. Yeah. We, we also have the UN Sustainable Development Goals that exactly. highlight number five and number ten about mm -hmm. reducing inequalities and also gender equality. Yeah. All of these are there to structure up and give the room for women and their growth. Yeah. However, there seem to be seen some lingering um, setbacks here. But let me find out from you from the basic point. What are some of the uh, remaining vulnerabilities of women now in the 21st century? Well, women are still vulnerable, like you said. We've had the, we now have the SDG Goal 5 that looks at gender inequality. But then I, I dare say that none of the other 16 goals will be achievable if gender equality is not looked at. Mm. Um, one of the vulnerabilities that has to do with women in this present age is um, education. Women are still vulnerable in terms of being able to progress because there are a lot of bottlenecks on the way that draws them back and they are not able to compete favorably mm. with their male counterparts. Um, also in terms of health, we are also experiencing a lot of um, uh, mothers dying t during childbirth there's lack of attention when it comes to women in healthcare. Mm. And efforts are being made, but then we are still, I mean, in this present age, we are still experiencing um, mothers dying at delivery, and that's a cause for worry, mm. yeah. You know, if, if these were happening pre-COVID-19, then post-COVID-19 or within COVID-19, raises a lot of eyebrows that, oh, then we have a lot of what to do in terms of bridging the gaps. But let's go this way. 
when COVID-19 invaded the African continent with our pred current predicament, how has it been for women and coping with COVID-19 and its implications? Yes, um, thank you very much for that. Um, um, I will not say that COVID-19 has brought about inequality. I would, but however, say that COVID-19 has rather come to highlight the fault lines of, of our gender inequalities. Mm -hmm. Because women are the primary health care givers, formally and informally. Formally as nurses, if somebody is sick and the person goes to the hospital, the person is most likely going to meet a nurse who is a, a female. Even though we have male nurses, you, do, you hardly find them at the um, OPDs. You find them doing something else aside what the women are doing. Yeah. So it has increased the vulnerability of women to con con contracting the disease. Yeah. In the homes, if, a, if somebody is sick, then it is the, the, the likelihood that it is a woman who take care of her is it, of that sick person is very high. Mm. To the extent that even when the woman is sick, she would have to still stand up and do what she has to do by, I mean, undermining her sicknesses mm. to be able to stand up and take care of the whole home. And so if somebody is sick in the family, normally COVID-19 does not present itself, even though we've been told of the symptoms, it, it does not present itself in some instances as how we know COVID should stand out for. And so in the process of taking care of these persons, mm. if the person has COVID-19, then the likelihood that the mothers or the caregivers who are mainly women who are taking care of them will contract the disease is very, very high. Mm. If my child is sick, regardless of if it's um, COVID-19, I, I would not immediately think about covering my nose to take care of him and all that. Mm. Yes. And then also when you go to the marketplaces, the market is full of women. Women are, in the, inf are the majority in the informal sector yes. here. And so they are mostly in the market. And you cannot, um, you cannot say that you are ensuring that there's social distancing in the market because you know that our markets are congested. Mm. And also the people who go to the market to buy food, to buy stuff, are mainly women. Yeah. And if you have sets of children, if there are sets of children and one of them is supposed to be sent to the market, very likely it has to be the girl child. Mm. And so the market becomes a hotspot for the transmission of these um, communicable diseases such as COVID-19. Mm. Yeah. You know, this is where we would like to transition to the next aspect whereby we talk about what exactly has influenced this gender inequality which puts, well, places women at this huge risk. What would you talk to, talk to you about that? Well, I will basically say that it is structural and it is institutional. Mm. What do I mean by that? We have, first of all, a patriarchal, a conservative patriarchal system mm. where men are said to be the head and it transcends our society. It transcends our religious beliefs because the Bible admonishes us that women should be quiet, men are at the top and all that. And so we've transferred it even into the workplaces. So the man is always um, the first point of leadership. Mm -hmm. And a man does not know how it feels like to be a woman. Women have peculiar situations, peculiar conditions based on our physiolo physiology that men cannot appreciate irrespective of how well they read about it. But then men are the helm of affairs, taking decisions for women. Mm -hmm. And then I'll say that our colonial structures has also not helped because attempts at education has been segmented where we have the girls, the, the girls schools being built and then the vocational schools. And these schools are meant to train women vocationally and more for the liberal arts where the boys schools like Presec are doing so well in science, you can tell from the um, um, national um, science, and math, science quiz, right? and math quiz, you saw how well um, the boys were doing. Mm. Because um, structurally, these schools are noted to be science schools. Yeah. Yes, and so the, the structure of education has not helped. I remember when I was in secondary school, I did the O-level system mm -hmm. where um, there was a period in the timetable where women 
we'll do home science, we'll go to the home science class, and then men will go to the um, technical drawing class. And so already women are being told that your place is in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. You must learn how to cook. And then I'll also say our tribal customs, where women are being married off at very young ages. And so they do not have the opportunity to progress. And education is very important. One cannot do without education. Countries have been able to leapfrog the development process just by educating their citizens. Mm. And the Asian Tigers are an example of that. We have Singapore, South Korea, who have been able to develop because they made sure that every citizen, irrespective of the citizen's gender, is educated. Mm. Yeah. You know, for over the past four decades, I mean, we've had stronger revolutions of advocacy for women yeah. and their growth. We can talk about the Beijing Convention and yes. many more. Yeah. Can you help us picture these um, conventions, these treaties, advocacies, and what were the crust of them towards and how have we achieved any of them? Well, we've, we've had the 1979, we had the convention for um, the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women, mm -hmm. which was um, seeking to look at ways that um, signatories to the convention were going to make sure that there wasn't any form of discrimination against women. Yeah. Um, we haven't achieved much. We've done well. There's been the um, establishment of DOFSU, which has helped to look at issues of gender, violence, I mean, domestic violence. We've also had the Beijing conference yeah. that looked at gender mainstreaming and women empowerment. And then we've also had the Dakar education, uh, Dakar framework for, for action, action yeah. which looked at the commitment yeah. of education for all. And also one of the key highlights of that um, Dakar um, framework for action was that no country committed to providing education for all mm -hmm. can be thwarted. Mm. If a country is committed that we want to make sure that we educate everybody, nothing can stand in its way. And then we've also had the AU gender policy. Yeah. We've had the Commonwealth gender policy. Yeah. And then we have recently, quite recently, the SDG goals, with the SDG goal five being gender inequality. And I have said that, I mean, you cannot achieve any of them without looking at gender inequality, uh, gender equality. Yeah. If you don't, because when it comes to provision of water, cities, still, it is women who go and fetch the water for the home. It is women who fetch the water for us to cook and all that. And so how do you achieve that if you don't look at the gender equality? But then I will say that there's been a lot of talk and it is now time to walk the talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Definitely now time to want to talk. Uh, stay with us as we talk more about the gender implications of COVID-19 and all that we need to know about it and the way forward. We'll be right back. You welcome back to AAU Talks on AAU TV as we're discussing gender implications of COVID-19. I'm here with Dr. Daniela D. Sedega, and she's the acting dean of students here at the University of Environment and Sustainable Development. And before we went on a break, we were about to progress into the, the, the hot matter, which is the contribution of higher education. We, we should be the beacon of excellence exactly. and an exemplary sport for others to learn from. Yeah. But Rokeza, we also have challenges in terms of gender progression. Uh -huh. And what has been the, the factors, or let's say the, the, the issues that we can point to hindering gender progression vertically in higher education? Um, thank you very much again. Um, I think that the major challenge for women in education is how to strike a balance between our productive rules and our reproductive rules. Mm. Um, if, a, if a man has a child in the course of his career, it does not set him back. But if a woman, the nine months period, the leave, um, the, the, the maternity leave period, is all centered at um, taking care of that child, again, the woman has other responsibilities in the house, aside being 
a career woman the woman has other responsibilities in the house like making sure that if a child if a child is sick there's this likelihood that it is the woman who would stay home and take care of her and all within that time the man is going up i mean climbing up mm. and then also i would say that there's a bias reward system mm. the bias reward system is because in our system if a woman is excelling mm -hmm. there's this likelihood that she's being tagged to maybe have perhaps warmed the bed of um, a superior to to come up to to, to climb up yeah. But then when a man is excelling, oh, he's very brilliant, you know? And so um, there's always this tag on women that they could not have made it with their own effort. Mm. There must be some help somewhere, yes. And then also I would say that there's also the lack of mentoring, which I, I cannot overemphasize because um, we need mentors as women. Very few women, the last time, I, I, I think three days ago, the graphic was saying that just about 1% of women are in um, management positions. Yeah. And so it makes it very few, I mean, they have a, the, the, there's this lack of um, people to mentor, the lack of women to mentor others, to lift them up yeah. to be able to abo avoid the bottlenecks that they faced whilst they were progressing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's very sad when we hear people tag women with a bias aspect that, um, well, if you're progressing, perhaps you're doing something yes. wrong, yeah. but, which is quite unfortunate because when women are progressing, there may be something wrong about them, yeah. which is quite sad. What has been the study? Has there been a study conducted by the Gender Committee here at UESD to ensure that we have adequate data about women and how and the implications that we saw that struck, that struck them yeah. with COVID-19? Yes, there's currently, I mean, we had a seminar series last week and Dr. Tudor Siama did a presentation on the gender, um, gender and then COVID-19 in the workplace. And then myself, and then Dr. Philippa, and Dr. Rosemary, and Dr. Apriku, Mark Apriku, are also working on a paper on the gendered implications of um, COVID-19. And we are looking not just at the workplace, but we are also looking at the informal sector, and specifically looking at the Kaya Ye, because the Kaya Ye are also, um, they, they are also suffering because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah. Some of them have been repatriated back home, but then they've had to come back because, again, they are not educated and they need, whilst, whilst they were helping in the homes, their male comp counterparts were being sent to school. And so without education, and let me say that education is a, an important tool for lifting up people out of poverty. And so when one is not educated, there's a likelihood, I'm not saying that if you're not educated, you cannot make it economically, but when one is educated, there's a likelihood for that person to, to, to break through the poverty and then make something of himself and him, him or herself in future. Mm. But it is not that way. So we are looking at that. We are in the process of finalizing our paper to send for publication. Mm. We'll share with you when it's true. Absolutely. No, now, we identify education as a very great tool to alleviate people from poverty. Yeah. What has been the role of higher education thus far in ensuring that gender inequality has been kept mm -hmm. for the past four decades? Has there been an action? I know we have treaties, conventions, and all that. Yeah. Has higher education made a deliberate effort to ensure that we are cutting the lines straight to alleviate women from, or from these, these shackles? Um, one of the things that is being done is the quota system, where some universities, some universities have made it a conscious effort mm. to increase the intake of women by, um, to increase the intake of women. Mm. And then also we have some clinics like the STEM clinic that is looking at encouraging more students, more girls, to do the science, technology, and then the engineering and mathematics courses, mm -hmm. yes. You know, recently we had some people saying that, 
Well, women in engineering, the women are, are, are created with special, are special people, uh, very, very complicated uh, f uh, physical features uh, to be engaged in a very male-dominated field like engineering. What can women cope with these things? When you hear things like these, how do you take them? Well, that is one of the gender stereotypes that I talked about, that women are not expected to do certain careers. For instance, like the engineering that you spoke about. Even for myself, as a, an acting dean of students, a lot of people expect that, oh, when they come, they are looking for the dean of students, they are expecting that it should, it should have been a man. Yes, even parents come in, they are surprised because they are not used to seeing women in such positions. And I must say that that is one of the successes that is being chalked by the University of Environment and Sustainable Development, mm. where our registrar is a woman. That's fantastic. Yes. That's fantastic. Look, looking beyond, do you, do you in any way uh, consent to the argument that women are not meant to do almost everything because of how unique they are and the human cycle that they go through? Mm -hmm. Maybe they may not be fit for doing everything. Yes. Oh, I, I would not say that women can do that and more, except that the structure should be able to accommodate their mm -hmm. peculiarities so that if I'm pregnant, my, the, if, I, if I'm pregnant and I'm an engineer and I'm getting advanced in the pregnancy, the structure should be able to accommodate that I will not be able to do that work. It doesn't mean that I cannot do it, mm -hmm. but at that material moment, I am not able to engage in that activities. Mm -hmm. But the structure does not accommodate that. And that is the problem. And so it looks like, oh, if I pick a woman, she's likely to go on maternity leave and all that. But that should not be the case. The structure should be able to accommodate our peculiar situations mm. because all that we do is not necessarily for us we are doing it for humanity having a child and even the children don't bear our surnames they bear the surnames of the men and yet they are not ready to do that sacrifice for us that's mm. that's something you know there is an estimate made that um with COVID 19 there's a likelihood that women many women, 47 million women and more will be pushed beneath the poverty line yeah. because of the setting they find themselves in, yeah. the inadequate education they have, they, they, they are in, and also the fact that COVID-19 has created that inconvenience yes. to cause that. Yeah. Can you help us understand which class of women are likely to fall in this poverty line? Yes. To a very large extent, women in the informal sector, where you, 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 you would bear witness that during the lockdown, women who were in the market could not, had to go, because these are persons who were taking, were earning wages on a daily basis. Mm. But even though there was a lockdown, a lot of those in the formal sector who were in the male majority were receiving their salaries. Yeah. But um, the casual workers, and a lot of the casual workers are also women, they had to stay home and these casual workers do not get paid if they do not go to work and so if one is if one loses their livelihood because of these covid restrictions and also because industries have been hardest hit because of the pandemic then it is going to push them economically down mm. yes. countries like rwanda and africa have made great strides in terms yeah. of giving women great positions, yeah. uh, given them a quota in their legislature, we have women leading as representatives than men. Yes. And look at how the economy is going. Would yeah. you want to say Rwanda is uh, an exemplifying economy to adapt and to follow in terms of their decision to give women, or let's uphold the quota system for women and representation? Yes, I, I would say that it is something worth emulating by Ghana because um, a lot of our, I mean, majority of our MPs, of those in political decision-making positions, are men. Rwanda has a quota system, and Rwanda happens to be one of the countries which has the highest number of women legislators. Yeah. We don't have that here. But even the constitution mandates us as a country to choose a particular percentage, more than 30%, 
of representatives should be women. But we, are not been, we have not been able to achieve that mm. because the, the political system seemed to be harsh towards women. So if a woman wants to stand for a position, if she's not married, it would be used against her. If she doesn't have children, it would be used against her. And so it makes it difficult for women to present themselves for such positions. Mm. But where there's a quota, quota system, where positions are restricted for women, it makes it easier to pull in more women to help in the decision-making process of a country. Now you have the opportunity to send a word of advocacy out there to the entire African continent on giving women an edge up to also represent yes. in all these facets. What will you craft for the African people in these times? I would say that um, as women, we understand ourselves, we understand ourselves better. Yeah. We understand how we, we, how our body plays out for us. We understand our problems better. We understand the hurdles that we face better. And so because of that, it is important to put women in positions to make decisions. After all, women are the majority in the whole world. Yeah. So why should it be that the minority should take over? At least, we are not even asking for women to be more than men in decision-making process. We are saying that there should be that equality. Mm. That is all that we are asking for. Mm. And I think that is fair. Amazing. So the SDG goal number five, even though it says about gender equality, particularly emphasizes that women should be given the level up because globally, women find themselves in a very deplorable state that needs to be corrected. So now ripping the gains, I uh, had a great time with Dr. Daniela Sedega as we talked about gender implications of COVID-19 and we saw the women in that very vulnerable spot. We are changing the narrative today and I believe that many of you have made great strides in changing the narrative. Let's look forward to achieving more to give the world a better place and women that comfort that they deserve. I appreciate your time with me, Doc, uh, on AAU Talks and also your time as well on AAU TV. Uh, have a nice day. Be safe. We'll come your way with more of our programs. Have a nice day. Bye.